evening, everyone. My name is Maria Pascuzzi. I am the director of Spirit Alive, speaking to you from Brooklyn, New York. And on behalf of the Sisters of St. Joseph of Brentwood, New York, I welcome all of you tonight, whether you are joining us from near or far, and whether you are old friends of Sisters of St. Joseph or Spirit Alive or new friends who are with us for the first time tonight. Welcome, welcome. Everyone is welcome as we begin our third season of Spirit Alive programming. In the webinar series we are launching tonight, Sexuality in the Sacred, we approach a topic that is complex, aspects of which are sometimes misunderstood, frequently controverted, or simply avoided. The inspiration for this series grew out of a conversation with a venerable member of my religious congregation. About two years ago, I was having lunch with Sister Ave, who insisted that Spirit Alive do a program on sexuality. I can still hear her words. We are all sexual, Maria. Sexual energy is your life force. It connects you to everything around you. We have to talk about it. It was not, as you can imagine, the kind of lunch conversation I expected to have with a 90-year-old sister. But the more I thought about it, the more I agreed that it was an urgent conversation that was needed, but too often avoided in the church. So tonight, we begin a conversation about sex and sexuality in Catholic teaching. And I would like to dedicate this webinar series to Sister Ave, who unfortunately passed away on July 30th of this year at the age of 92 in the 75th year of her religious life. Before I introduce our distinguished presenter, please bear with me as I have a few announcements for you. The first announcement, and many of you have already asked this question, is this. Each webinar is being recorded. A link will be sent to you when the recording is posted to our Spirit Alive YouTube channel. You can always go to the Spirit Alive uh, homepage and click on recordings if you want, but be assured that a link will come to you once the um, the recording is posted. Matthew, our uh, IT tech, sometimes takes uh, 48 to 72 hours, so don't expect it there tomorrow morning, but you'll have it. Second, if you have audio trouble, you can click the letter CC. If you have an iPad or a tablet, I think the letters are um, at the top of your screen. If you're working with a, a computer, I think CC is in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. And if you choose CC closed caption, you'll be able to hear uh, the presenter's speech tonight, no, excuse me, see it uh, on the text. Third thing, if you have questions at any time during the presentation, feel free to type your questions into the chat box um, and we will answer or the presenter will answer as many questions as time allows at the end of his presentation. Finally, if you like our programming, and I hope you do, please show your appreciation by making a donation to Spirit Alive online. Your support, along with the support of the Sisters of St. Joseph, makes our programming possible. Now, I would like to introduce tonight's presenter, Dr. Todd Saltzman, who will launch our webinar series with his presentation entitled Christianity's Problem with Sex. Todd is the Graf Professor of Catholic Theology at Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska, specializing in Catholic theological ethics. He is an award-winning author or co-author of 11 books, one of which, The Sexual Person, published by Georgetown University, was a finalist for the prestigious Gromeyer Award in Religion. His essays and articles, too numerous to recount, appear in various academic journals as well as popular media and reflect Todd's varied research interests. Many are focused on sexual ethics, the sexual person, sexuality, and sexual anthropology. Todd is an active member of the Society of Christian Ethics, the Catholic Theological Society of America, and the Association of Moral Theologians. He and his wife, Katie, live in Omaha and have three children. 
honestly, I could not think of a more accomplished and insightful speaker to be with us on tonight's topic. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Todd Saltzman. Todd. Thank you very much, Sister Maria. First of all, I'd like to thank Sister Maria uh, and Matthew, the technician, people working behind the scenes, also the Sisters of St. Joseph's and Spirit Alive. I, I'm honored to be part of this program and look forward to our time together. I'd also like to, to mention that I've collaborated extensively with Dr. Michael Lawler, and so the presentation this evening is the fruits of that collaboration as well. So uh, I will call up my PowerPoint here and then we can begin. And welcome to all of you as well. It's, it's wonderful to have this opportunity and to be able to discuss very important uh, issues regarding human sexuality and Catholic teaching. So I adjusted the title a bit, but it, it gets to the point as well. Sex and Catholics, what's old and what's new. Uh, I want to look at various aspects here. First of all, current Catholic teaching on sexual ethics, just to situate where we are, what's old, how did it, we get to where we are, and then what's new. Um, and Amoris Laetitia is certainly primary there. New pastoral methods, we'll talk about the implications for human sexuality and then some of the future prospects. So first of all, Catholic teaching on sexual ethics, current Catholic teaching, all Catholic moral theological teaching is grounded in the idea of human dignity. So what facilitates human dignity is good. What frustrates human dignity is bad. And so uh, that begs the question, raises the question about sexual anthropology. How do we define the human, the sexual person, and what norms or doctrines, rules follow from that? Current Catholic teaching, you find all over official documents, but in the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, teaches that you, any human genital act whatsoever may be placed only within the framework of marriage. So basically, Catholic sexual ethic is a marital ethic, and it's grounded in what's known as inseparability principle, articulated and formulated in Humanae Vitae, the 1968 encyclical addressing birth control as well as, as marriage, and the two intrinsic meanings of the sexual act. So the unitive meaning unites couples emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, relationally, and then the procreative meaning of the sexual act is that it's open to the transmission of life. So the Catholic doctrine on sexual ethics and sexuality teaches that uh, what's moral or reproductive type sexual acts between a married couple, and what's immoral are any non-reproductive sexual acts between heterosexuals and same-sex couples. This would include within the marriage relationship, no contraception, uh, certainly no premarital sex, no reproductive type sexual acts, no same-sex acts, no artificial reproductive technology. So a lot of no's there. <laughs> and and the, the positive emphasis is on reproductive sexual acts within the marital relationship, okay? Uh, the approach is certainly, it's a one-size-fits-all. So, and we'll talk about this in more detail, but in Catholic social teaching, you have principles that are, are dependent on context, circumstances, relationships, and interpretation. In sexual ethics, it's a one size fits all. It's absolute rules, guidelines, no contraception, no same sex acts. Uh, it's physicalist or primarily physicalist in terms of what we call heterogenital or heteronormative sexuality uh, to be somewhat crass, but very honest and, and accurate. 
unless you have penis and vagina is in a sexual act, there's no possibility of a moral sexual act in Catholic teaching. Um, certainly the personal and relational, the unitive are essential as well, but the point of departure is uh, uh, biologically complementary genitalia, okay? It tends to be patriarchal, disregards culture and gender considerations, prioritized biology over relationship, ignores science and experience frequently. So for instance, uh, we just finished an article on same-sex parenting, and the church says uh, teaches officially that same-sex parents actually do violence to adopted or fostered children uh, in terms of their integral human development, and yet the science overwhelmingly dismisses that claim. So science and experience are certainly important in Catholic sexual ethics, but oftentimes they're, they're disregarded when the science and experience challenges what the church teaches. In terms of the application or living out of Catholic sexual teaching, it tends it is very deductive. So you have the norm, no birth control, reproductive technologies, et cetera, and it imposes that on all relationships, regardless of the context, situation, circumstances, et cetera. So deductive over inductive reasoning. So that's just a quick summary of Catholic sexual teaching in terms of the norms, the guidelines, uh, the doctrines for human sexuality grounded in a theological anthropology that's, that's a strict sexual binary and, and heteronormative between male and female. How did we get here? What's, what's the history of this? So, First of all, we're going to look at scripture. Reading, interpreting, and applying scripture uh, is complicated, to say the least. And de verbum, yet you have this challenge in Catholic, Catholic teaching in general, but Catholic moral teaching and sexual teaching in particular. Up until 1943, Divino Afflante Spiritu, and then again at, at the Second Vatican Council, De Verbum, the Word of God issued this, uh, was a document that talked about the method for reading, interpreting, and applying scripture, historical critical method. Up until the 20th century, you had a very different method for developing and formulating norms, doctrines, and guidelines in the church, either proof texting, coming to conclusions, and natural law, and then saying, okay, where can we find a, a passage in scripture that justifies this? Or fundamentalism, reading scripture literally. Um, in the 20th century, the church established a new method for reading and interpreting scripture, uh, the historical critical method. And what you have is 1950 years of tradition, basically, reading and interpreting scripture in one way, and then a totally new method for reading and interpreting scripture, and a disconnect between what was said and taught that came before that to a large extent, and that what flows from that in light of this new method. So it's important to keep that in mind as we go through scriptures. So if we look at scripture and sexuality, there's a tale of two narratives in a way, that you can draw from scripture looking at human sexuality. One emphasizes the equality between male and female and positivity regarding human sexuality, the sexual person, sex within in relationships, etc. The other is more patriarchal and suspicious of human sexuality. So we're gonna do a quick run through some examples of where you find these two different narratives in both Old Testament and New Testament. And then we'll look at uh, how the history develops in light of these. So if you focus on the first narrative, equality and positivity, look into the Hebrew Bible at the apex of Yahweh's creation stands Adam, man and woman together, male and female. He, God created them and blessed them and named them Adam. Okay, Yahweh names male and female together Adam. 
indicating equality, and they become one body. Body, the Hebrew verb dabak in Greek kalo, does suggest physical, bodily, sexual union, but it suggests above all spiritual union, which exists in conjugal love. So a very positive understanding of, of the body. And you have John Paul II talking about the theology of the body that draws from that, that integration uh, of uh, the, the emotional, psychological, biological, etc. But John Paul also defended the tradition on those absolute norms that that sometimes come into question among the faithful, certainly as they live out their human sexuality. We'll get there. Okay. So Adam and Eve in Genesis 1.25, there were both naked and not ashamed. Uh, in, in the Song of Songs, Song of Solomon, you find a very erotic <laughs> poem about human sexuality. Some have tried to to uh, interpret that as allegory and just talking about the relationship between Israel and Yahweh. But most biblical exegetes would say, no, this is an erotic poem that is very positive about human sexuality and about the expression of that. Hosea's marriage to Gomer, a prophetic symbol, the covenant between Yahweh and Israel is reflected in the covenant between husband and wife. So again, very positive, sacred, uh, relational, personal in that sense. In the New Testament, Jesus and the Gospels, sexuality isn't a, a predominant issue in the Gospels and in terms of what's recorded as Jesus' sayings and reflections. Uh, he's very pro-woman in the Gospels, he, which is countercultural to his day. Uh, there's no word on same-sex relationships. So it's really interesting. There, there tends to be a real obsession uh, in the church these days with same-sex relationships, same-sex parenting, LGBTQ community, et cetera, in a very negative way oftentimes, unfortunately, and in a very hurtful way. And the text used to, to condemn same-sex relationships are very limited, and Jesus says nothing in the entire gospel is about same-sex relationships. When he has an opportunity to do so, when he uh, refers to Sodom and Gomorrah, it's in the context of evangelization, sending the apostles out and saying that if they reject you, hospitality, it will fall worse on them than it did uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, so even when Jesus had an opportunity to reflect or, or, or uh, incorporate some reference to same-sex relationships. It's about hospitality, which is often the interpretation of Sodom and Gomorrah. And then the other texts that condemn same-sex relationships are very, very suspicious. And uh, you can critique them from the historical critical method to raise serious questions about whether or not they apply in any way uh, to same-sex relationships as we understand them today. And that, that's a very important point as well. Again, Jesus puts men and women on the same level. Teachings on marriage and divorce somewhat disingenuously. Uh, the church says that it's very clear in the, in the New Testament that Jesus condemns divorce and remarriage, and indissolubility is the only option, and yet in Matthew's gospel, there's a justification for divorce. Porneia is a basis for uh, dissolving the marriage, as is the, the Pauline privilege in favor of the faith, and then later the Petrine privilege. So there are examples of dissolution of marriage, and even Jesus speaks about an example, porneia. Now, biblical scholars disagree on what that means. It, it's an ambiguous term. Literally, it means sexual filthiness or nastiness. But what does that mean within the historical cultural context and within uh, marital relationships? So Jesus is very positive in terms of equality between men and women. Sexuality is the predominant issue for him. St. Paul, 
in his letters, Galatians, there's no longer Jew or Greek, no longer slave or free, again, uh, recognizing equality among all people, slave free, male, female. Uh, Ephesians 5.21, because you fear or stand in awe of Christ, give way to one another, mutual giving. Way is required of all Christians, even of husbands and wives, as they seek holiness together in marriage, very positive view of marriage and very egalitarian view of men and women within the marriage relationship. The husband should give to the wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband, for the wife does not rule over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not rule over his own body, but the wife Okay, so again, equality, egalitarian relationship, positive views, etc. On the other hand, <laughs> the other narrative that we have is communicates a strong patriarchal structure, and then also it um, is very suspicious of human sexuality and the human body. So. The Hebrew Bible, again, beginning with the, the First Testament or Old Testament, in the beginning, the creation myth common to Jews, Christians, associates the naked body with shame. Prior to eating the forbidden fruit in the garden in, e in Eden, the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. After the fall, they, the eyes of both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. Nakedness for Jews and Christians has been a matter of shame ever since, according to Adrian Thatcher, both in public and in private. And we can see that suspicion of the body, of nakedness, uh, of human sexuality as it plays out, as the tradition develops. Genesis 2.24, the one flesh. There is no particular language in Hebrew for marriage or wife or husband. What gets translated in various contexts as Mary is properly take or seize. So man taking woman or seizing woman. Uh, the latter is also used in the case of rape. So obviously a, a strong patriarchy there and an inequality. Sirach 25:24, woman is the origin, origin of sin, and it is through her that we all die. Not exactly a positive view of women and their role and function in the historical development of understanding human sexuality and the anthropology that accompanies that. A friend of mine used to joke, and he was being very facetious, women are two-time losers, created second, sin first. And and he didn't buy into that, obviously, but we we can see how that narrative has been reflected in the narrative, uh, uh, the Christian tradition in general and the Catholic tradition in particular. The New Testament, Jesus and the Gospels, again, the focus in the catechism, marriage is indissoluble. Uh, Pope John Paul II, no communion for divorce and remarried would be based on that claim of indissolubility. So exclusion from the sacraments. And why exclusion? Because divorce and remarriage without an annulment, seen as living in sin, committing adultery. Therefore, you're not worthy to receive communion because of your particular state. Now, as we'll see, Pope Francis is fundamentally, you can call it an organic development of doctrine or a change of doctrine, but where John Paul, Pope John Paul II, condemned the possibility of divorce and remarried without annulment from receiving communion, Pope Francis in Amoris Laetitia opens that up as a possibility based on the authority and inviolability of conscience in and through discernment and accompaniment in the process of uh, looking at where your life is, what led to the divorce, learning from that, and moving on, and allowing for participation in the Eucharist. So two very different teachings, but those teachings also, to a certain re respect, or reflect those two different narratives that we find 
and the scriptures, depending upon how you read, interpret, and apply it. And so scripture, we have to be very careful about how we use and sometimes even abuse scripture in our approach to human sexuality and sexual ethics. St. Paul uh, had a rather negative view of human sexuality in, in several passages because, in large part, he was expecting the parousia, the second coming of Jesus, and therefore there would be no need to marry in a sense because Jesus was coming back and everything, eschatology would arrive in the end times, etc. So in, in 1 Corinthians, if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to be on fire. Not a huge endorsement of marriage or human sexuality or the sex that takes place within marriage. If you can control it, better to do so. If you're going to burn with lust, well, go ahead and marry. <laughs> okay. Um, those who marry will experience distress in this life, and I would spare you that. Again, 1 Corinthians, it produces both anxiety and divided loyalties. A spouse is a distraction for more important matters. So those are some rather negative perspectives. Uh, St. Paul on women, Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and transgressed. First Timothy, wives should be subordinate to their husbands as to the Lord. People often like to use that passage a lot when it comes to the marriage relationship, reinforcing patriarchy and uh, inequality within the marriage relationship. And yet, as we saw, there are plenty of texts that challenge that. So if we look at tra tradition in terms of the Bible, the patriarchal narrative, rather negative, naked bodies are shame, women are inferior, and to a large extent responsible for sin, the fallen human nature of human beings, virginity is superior, marriage inferior, and sex is tainted, as we'll see. Uh, sex is often identified with how original sin is passed on. A more egalitarian, positive narrative, naked bodies, there's no shame, women are equal, virginity is an option, but marriage is good, and sex is good. So you have these two narratives competing with one another and drawn from the, the same inspired word of God. So Again, it highlights the challenge of using scripture when it comes to human sexuality. If we move on into the church fathers, Clement of Alexandria, if marriage according to law is sinful, I do not see how anyone can say he knows God and say that sin was commanded by God, but if the law is holy, marriage is holy. Uh, the apostle, therefore, refers this mystery to Christ in the church. Again, a very positive notion of marriage and, and sexuality in response. In fact, many of the heresies that were developing at the time, Manichaeism, for instance, uh, Pelagianism uh, is another heresy, but Manichaeism in particular that was very dualistic and anti-marriage, as well were people like Jerome. Okay, Augustine was the most influential in terms of the development of, of human sexuality and, and morality in, in relation to human sexuality. So three goods of marriage is his primary teaching regarding human sexuality. First and foremost, it's to procreate and endure the survival of the species. Secondly, it's fidelity, what we would call the relationality or what came to be known as the unitive. And thirdly, it's a sacrament, not one of the seven sacraments. That didn't occur until uh, the second, second millennium, um, 1140, I think, Council of Rome. Um, it took a long time for that tradition to develop. And, and that's another important, important point when thinking about Catholic doctrine, it just didn't fall from the sky. These things evolved over time and oftentimes evolved and changed organically or even changed uh, with regard to the teaching itself. And, and if they change historically, church doctrine change, which it did on usury, slavery, uh, even more recently, capital punishment with Pope Francis, 
then it can continue to change in, in other areas, even in human sexuality. So sacrament is uh, august and emphasized indissolubility of the marriage relationship. Sexual intercourse, pleasure, uh, are are suspect with Augustine. Um, he says that sex is good, but because of concupiscence, a consequence of original sin, it can be tainted, especially when it's pleasurable. And for Augustine, there's there are two narratives as well. <laughs> we'll get to that in a minute. But women are basically for procreation. But Augustine also recognizes the fidelity, the relationality uh, between husband and wife, very positive. Um, and he also recognizes that in fertile couples, their marriage is still indissoluble and something good. So Augustine was positive in a lot of respects, but. <laughs> Like scripture, you have two narratives when it comes to Augustine. In his treatise on conjugal, the conjugal good, conjugal sexual intercourse for the sake of offspring is not sinful, but sexual intercourse even with one's spouse to satisfy concupiscence or disordered desire is a venial sin. Now, we have two narratives on Augustine. One, is to emphasize the positive aspect of marriage and even sex within marriage as something good, but it's tainted by original sin. But for his time and place, Augustine was very progressive, especially if you look to people like Jerome and the Manichees who were very negative on, on human sexuality and marriage also. Uh, so you have that narrative some would say that narrative was lost by the interpreters of Augustine. But then you also have the narrative that says, well, sexual intercourse is good, but if it's too pleasurable or laced with lust or too desiring, then it's sinful, at least venially sinful. Uh, a moral theologian, Daniel McGuire, likes to say that the church continues to live under the shadow of Augustine's penis. <laughs> Only a, a, a <laughs> Irish humor could get away with that. But what he means by that is that Augustine had a very promiscuous lifestyle before his conversion. And that there's a certain amount of guilt and shame that comes out in his writings and his theology when it comes to human sexuality. So on the one hand, he does say that marriage is good and sex within marriage is good. But on the other hand, it is venially sinful and it's we have to be very careful about human sexuality, which is true, but there's a negative view of sexuality that permeated the tradition and to a certain extent continues to permeate that tradition. Pope Gregory the Great sort of summarizes one interpretation of Augustine that took it in a certain direction. And by the way, just going back to Augustine, one could think of uh, original sin, the whole idea of concupiscence, as the first STD. In other words, it was passed on in and through sexual intercourse. And that that idea uh, uh, were born with original sin, the whole immaculate conception that Mary was born without original sin uh, is, is tied to human sexuality as well. And it doesn't bode well for a positive understanding of human sexuality. Pope Gregory the Great, the custom of the Romans from antiquity, he explained, has always been after sexual intercourse with one's spouse, both to cleanse oneself by washing to abstain reverently from entering the church for a time. In saying this, we do not intend to say that sexual intercourse is sinful, but because every lawful sexual intercourse between spouses cannot take place without bodily pleasure, again, the suspect of pleasure and desire, they're to refrain from entering the holy place for such pleasure cannot be without sin. So you have this idea that permeates the tradition that sex, it's good for procreation, but 
don't enjoy it too much. It can't be too pleasurable. And in fact, it generally is so that it's sinful in a way that prevents you from participating in the sacred, right? That dichotomy between the sexual and the sacred becomes widened throughout history. So just a quick run through history, the penitentials, originally in the church, that you had all, uh, the, the norm was uh, deathbed confessions. Why? Because confession was allowed once in one's life. And so you wanted to, to calculate correctly. <laughs> so you had one shot at it. Well, auricular confession, auricular means literally to speak in the ear, developed around the fifth century, a little earlier. And it was the idea that you could repeat the sacrament of penance. Uh, and be forgiven multiple times. So the penitentials developed out of this tradition. The Celtic monks were very influential in this. If you've been to Ireland, it can be very cold, damp, and dreary. And so the, the monks had a sort of dapper view on reality at times, and it manifested in these handbooks uh, of moral theology, the, the penitentials, and, and also especially the teaching on sexuality. So general rule in some of the penitentials, uh, sexual intercourse permitted only between a man and a woman who are married, and even then only for procreation. Every other sexual act is prescribed. Anglo-Saxon canons of Theodore around 690 prescribed that whoever emits semen into the mouth shall do penance for seven years. This is the worst of evils. Couple points here. There was no uh, Father O'Connor one Hill married to our fathers at this point in history. The penances were brutal and extensive, and especially for sexual sin. And then also notice whoever emits semen into the mouth this is the worst of evils. Well, worse than rape, worse than uh, adultery. There was what's called a homunculus theory that, that will shake the tradition's biological understanding through Aquinas up until the 1850s when the female ovum was discovered. The idea that the semen was a little human being. And so if you ejaculated, either in the mouth or masturbated or in any orifice that wasn't conducive to putting the seed where it could grow and develop into a human being, it was the worst of sins because it was a form of genocide or murder in the sense. That biology impacted the tradition and the understanding of human sexuality within the tradition. And so same-sex relationships as well were reflected in that because you couldn't uh, deposit the semen where it could develop as it naturally was supposed to do so into a human being. The Celtic penitential of Colum Columban prescribes that if anyone practices masturbation or sins with a beast, he shall do penance for two years if he is not in clerical orders, but if he is in order or has a monastic vow, he shall do penance for three years unless his tender age protects him. Important point here, for two years if he's not clerical, longer if he is clerical, right? Why is that? Well, initially, in scripture, first of all, there's no condemnation of masturbation. It came about early in the tradition and it was limited to the holy orders, religious nuns or, or priests. Um, and then it gradually expanded to lay people as well, the non-religious. So that whole development was a development in the understanding of chastity and human sexuality. And so you get a greater penance for non or for religious than non-religious. And this evolution of the sin of masturbation is um, illustrative of how the, the the tradition evolved over time, but also the negative view of human sexuality based on bad biology oftentimes. Aquinas took a more positive view than Augustine, although he followed Augustine closely, but it took a more positive view on human sexuality, especially pleasure within the relationship. Three ends of marriage following uh, 
Augustine, procreation, faithfulness, and sacrament, and, and the, the sacrament that was indissolubility grew into one of the seven sacraments over time. Has a positive view of pleasure that realized the ends, um, but then he also talks about natural law and sexual ends, and that he talks about the greatest violations of natural law are unnatural acts, and uh, masturbation, bestiality, are, are unnatural acts that are the gravest sins, violations of natural law and nature, whereas adultery, rape, uh, fornication, etc., are violations of natural law, but they're natural sins, not unnatural. And so for Augustine, a greater violation of natural law was masturbation than rape or adultery or premarital sex. And you say, wait a minute, what's going on here? Uh, that That is fundamentally problematic. Well, it's grounded in, uh, in a physicalist, biological understanding of natural and the homunculus theory that, that uh, believed that the sperm, the seed was a uh, human being. So at least in the case of rape, adultery, or fornication, the seed would be deposited naturally where it belonged, whereas in the case of same-sex relationships or masturbation or bestiality, it's not. Um, so again, historical context is important in terms of how we think about human psychology. The Manuals of Moral Theology after the Council of Trent which basically informed priests for the sacrament of reconciliation were very much accent of what they do, how many times uh, is it prohibited, very legalistic. It, they didn't typically focus on what was the meaning of the sacrament for the two people involved or for the individual, but it was focused on whether that adopted the normal commandments, especially the sixth and ninth commandments, very legalistic and absolute. Okay. Um, Jim Keenan summarizes in his book on the history of Catholic moral theology, summarizes three main points that shape the teaching on secular law. And I think those give us a better understanding of how the uh, tradition evolved. Sins is according to the nature and sins against the nature. Again, we mentioned that with Aquinas. Sins is according to nature were bad, but not as bad as sins against the nature. And again, rape, adultery, uh, incest were sins according to the nature because it had the possibility of the semen going in the correct orifice where it could be developed, where sins against nature, same sex like relationships. Uh, masturbation or sins against nature are much worse because they didn't allow for that teleology of nature from its force. So, a native view on human sexuality. Um, in forensic evil, so sins according to nature, sins against nature. Intrinsic evil, the term introduced into Catholic discourse around the 14th century, um, any sexual act was an intrinsically evil act. In other words, it can never be justified um, in any situation. And so that created an absolute perspective on human sexuality, whereas killing isn't even an intrinsically evil act. So you see the disparity between sexuality and other issues, whether it's arson, whether it's killing, all sorts of other issues where you would say, well, that seems a lot worse than masturbation or whatever. Intrinsic evil was incorporated, especially utilized when it came to sexual sins. No poverty of matter, what does that mean? Poverty of matter says that there's gray area. When it comes to sexuality and sexual ethics, there's no poverty, poverty of matter. In other words, every sexual sin is a potential mortal sin based on the three requirements of mortal sin. First, grave matter. Second, freedom. And third, knowledge. Now, with regard to any sexual sin, there was no poverty of matter. Every sexual sin was grave matter. 
and therefore a potential mortal sin, depending on knowledge and freedom. No other area has that qualification when it comes to sex or, or ethics. So there's this, this emphasis on sex and a negative view of human sexuality and a disproportionate focus and emphasis on human sexuality, which continues today. You can violate Catholic social teaching all you want and never be denied communion, right? Um, whether it comes to just wage or universal health care or access to education, et cetera. But if you uh, speak out in favor of same-sex relationships or uh, other sexual sins, that becomes grounds for denying human uh, uh, communion. Abortion certainly as well related to sexuality, but it's a bit more complex than that. So uh, a rather negative view of human sexuality. Vatican II, Gaudium et Spes, I got some time left. Uh, you have an important development in terms of personalism, focusing on the unitive dimension, a removal of the hierarchy of the ends of marriage, the unitive and procreative are on equal levels, emphasis on the person, relationship, marriage is a communion of love and intimate partnership ship of conjugal life and love, very positive aspects. Even in Humanae Vitae, it's very, very positive about human sexuality, the unitive, the procreative, et cetera. It's just how the disconnect between those positive principles and the norms that it derives from those principles where we, we have challenges. What's new? We don't want to end on a negative note with regard to church teaching, where we're at, where we've been. So what's new? There have been calls for reform. And, and just to be clear, we're living in a fascinating period right now in terms of the church. Uh, we see Pope Francis trying to move the church forward, especially in terms of ecclesiology and synodality and some of the implications of that for doctrine, such as sexual ethical doctrine, and the rabid resistance to that in some quarters, uh, a bishop accusing Cardinal McElroy uh, of heresy, for instance, when he calls for radical inclusion of LGBTQ people. Those tensions are hugely unfortunate, but that's the reality we find ourselves in. And in order to reconstruct, there always has to be a deconstruction. And in this case, it's a deconstruction uh, of method, of anthropology, of ecclesiology, in order to reconstruct into something more healthy, more whole, more holy, and the resistance in that process, because people don't like change oftentimes. So calls for reform, just some examples here. Bishop Helmut Deezer of Aachen asserts that same-sex feelings and love are not an aberration, but a variant of human sexuality. He claims that uh, church teaching on human sexuality is too simple. He argues as science shows not a glitch, not an illness, not an expression of any kind of deficit, in homosexuality, homosexuality is God's will. He would say Bishop George Botzing, president of the German Bishops Conference, calls for reform of church doctrine that needs to include fundamental truths of faith and morals, progressive theological reflection, and also an openness to more recent results of the human sciences and life situations of people today. We met Pope Francis a couple of years ago in a, more, uh, in a conference in Rome discussing Amoris Laetitia, and his message to the group of 150 moral theologians gathered was, keep doing what you're doing, move the church forward. It has to move forward. And, and that was very inspiring, very fortunate. Unfortunate side of that meeting, uh, I went up, shook hands with the Pope. They told us to take off our mask. I did so, and the next day I tested positive for COVID. Not good, but the Pope's okay, I was okay, so all ended well. <laughs> Little anecdote there. Cardinal Hallrich of Luxembourg argues that sociological scientific foundation of Catholic teaching on homosexuality is no longer correct. 
it's time for a fundamental revision of the doctrine on homosexual acts and on sexuality in general, contraception, for instance. The German Bishops' Conference, uh, the Synodal Way, Cardinal Marx, all calling to bless same-sex civil unions. Again, Cardinal McElroy from San Diego, radical inclusion of, of queer people. We, uh, not a derogatory term, an inclusive term for LGBTQ in the church. Amoris Laetitia has been a really important document emphasizing development in how we think about human sexuality. Cardinal Schoenborn talks about AL. It's a great text of moral theology we've been waiting for since the days of the Second Vatican Council. It represents an organic development of doctrine. Some of the significant developments in Amoris Laetitia in general or in specific in Pope Francis' papacy in general, anthropologically, he's reintroduced the authority and inviolability of conscience. This is really crucial in terms of approaching Catholic sexual teaching. Pope Francis writes in Amoris Laetitia, we also, the church, find it hard to make room for the consciences of the faithful, we have been called to form consciences, not to replace them. Conscience is, when it's well informed, has a moral obligation to follow it in terms of human dignity, even against ecclesiastical authority. Joseph Ratzinger wrote in his commentary on Gaudium et Spes, number 16, which is the, the focal paragraph on conscience. Virtue focus, character and values are emphasized in Amoris Laetitia over acts and rules. In the entire document, 270 pages, something like that, chastity is only mentioned once. The whole catechism is re revolves in terms of sexual teaching around chastity. In Amoris Laetitia, it's used once in reference to facilitating love between human beings. Um, Pope Francis has done a remarkable service to Catholic moral teaching and Amoris Laetitia. What he's done is he's brought together Catholic social teaching and Catholic sexual teaching. So whereas Catholic sexual teaching tends to focus on the biological, the act, rule, absolutes, and deductive, Catholic social teaching is relational, principle, focus, contingent, and inductive. And so an example of this integration, Pope Francis writes, in some countries, de facto unions, cohabitation between people are numerous, not only because of rejection of values, which is obviously problematic, but primarily because celebrating a marriage is considered too expensive in the social circumstances. As a result, material poverty drives people into de facto unions. That's a remarkable statement. And he furthermore claims that we can't condemn outright irregular situations such as cohabitation. We have to look at the relationship, the meaning of the relationship, the circumstances, especially the economic circumstances that impact human relationships, and a couple needs to discern in and through conscience how to live out discipleship within their particular situation. And therefore, the absolute doctrines don't always apply. And he quotes Aquinas for the first time, which is remarkable in this document, regarding uh, uh, moral principles and says, the more we descend from the principle, no cohabitation, no premarital sex, the more it's influenced by circumstances and the more the principle may not apply. And so it's really a remarkable inclusion of Aquinas's principle into Catholic, official Catholic teaching. Uh, general rules, inductive, beginning with circumstances, context, et cetera, and then saying, well, which rule applies? And then ecclesiologically, synodality is, is an amazing, movement in the church instantiated by Pope Francis. It's an attempt to incarnate the communion vision of Vatican II. 
and to promote dialogue. Synodality literally means journeying together in dialogue and not being afraid of dialogue and including all voices in that process of dialogue, which is really crucial. And what's come out of that synodal process is that the church's sexual teaching is problematic and it's driving a lot of uh, Catholics away from the church because not only the sex abuse crisis, but also because of sexual teaching and the alienation, especially for members of the queer community, LGBTQ community. Um, so some of the, the implications for human sexuality, irregular situations, cohabitation, you could include same-sex relationships in that, although Pope Francis doesn't, but he does support same-sex civil unions. Uh, in his writings and in it, it, what he's said in interviews, et cetera. He does so for two reasons. One, to protect marriage between man and woman as a sacrament in the church, but also to protect same-sex couples from discrimination. And yet in the Catholic Church in the United States, the bishops, the USCCB collectively oppose any non-discrimination legislation when it comes to same-sex relationships and same-sex parenting or adoption or even employment. So there's a real prioritization in the church with sexual ethics over social ethics. And for Pope Francis, he's inverted those two and emphasized that we need to address issues of poverty, uh, issues of social justice before we think about sexual ethics and, and prioritize that. So a real inversion and that inversion has created a lot of tension. Cohabitation, he doesn't condemn outright. It can be a result of uh, uh, economics that drive people into de facto unions, same-sex civil unions, divorce and communion he allows without an annulment based on accompaniment, based on discernment, based on formation of conscience and the authority of conscience. Women in the church, he's talked about discussion, on, ongoing discussion on that. So a lot of developments in Pope Francis's papacy that's making a lot of people nervous. Contraception, I, I miss that one, sorry. In Amoris Satizi, he says that natural means are to be promoted. He nowhere cites Humanae Vitae or any other document that condemns artificial birth control outright. And in fact, the census fidelium has rejected that teaching overwhelmingly. And that's what synodality is about, is listening to the voices, the experiences of people in marriage relationships. Some of the future prospects, and I'll end here, Cardinal Schoenborn talks about uh, Amoris Laetitia and Pope Francis, his uh, organic development of doctrine, Doctrine can evolve and change, dogma can't, but church teaching, let's be very clear, church teaching on doctrines on sexuality, they're absolutes, but they're non-infallible, meaning they're not dogmas, they're not infallible teaching, and canon law recognizes that an informed conscience can dissent from non-infallible teaching. Um, so that's a very important point. Developing new pastoral methods for doing Catholic sexual ethics, incorporating context, relationships, Catholic social teaching into the discussion, drawing out the anthropological, methodological, ecclesial reforms for Catholic sexual ethics that Pope Francis has introduced and built upon in the best of that tradition. Those two narratives going back both with Augustine and uh, uh, scripture implementing reforms into development. We see such a polarized hierarchy right now. And, and the synodal process coming up in October is going to be remarkable because I think it could be get very nasty. You have deep polarization, especially in the U.S. church. And that's why Pope Francis appointed people like Cardinal McElroy Supich uh, to counterbalance the USCCB's appointment of more conservative uh, bishops who are skeptical of the whole process of synodality and somewhat skeptical of Pope Francis himself. So 
it's a real challenging time in the church, but I think it's an exciting time uh, for the church as well and opening up the Holy Spirit to work in and through the synodal process gives me great hope uh, right now. There are, I, I'm out of time, I think, and I want to allow time for questions. So I'm not going to finish up on some of these, but, but the PowerPoint is there. You can look at these and I'm happy to send this out. So uh, I think there there is a credibility gap in terms of church Catholic sexual teaching. And we need, we're, we're bleeding people in a sense and, and, and people who are focusing on Catholic sexual teaching and how it alienates them rather than focusing on all the good work the Catholic Church does, uh, the, the Sisters of St. Joseph and all religious orders, nuns, priests, lay people, et cetera. And I think it's really unfortunate. We really need to come back to focusing on the meaning of relationship in terms of sexuality and people striving to live out discipleship the best they can in a way that reflects the gospel imperative, love God, self and neighbor, and that we strive to do that in and through our relationships. It's not a matter of trying to get away with things. I think there's sometimes a negative anthropology when it comes to human sexuality. People, if, if they weren't concerned about the church and living a life of discipleship, they'd ignore it totally. Um, but questioning is a healthy thing. It's a good thing. And the spirit works in and through that process. So thank you very much. I look forward to your questions and, and I'll go into the chat and start taking a look at those questions now. Yeah, it is painful. That, that's all I have to say. It's challenging, but it's important. History is so important to know that a person said this is excruciatingly painful to listen to. I was unaware of all of this, but so painful right now. Um, it's important to know the history, to know where we are, where we were, how we got here, and how we need to move forward. Uh, and, and there is patriarchy. It continues. Uh, Pope Francis is involving women in the synodal process, and women will have a vote. But uh, the, the bar is so low. Uh, it's incredibly frustrating to see how women are treated or maltreated in the church in terms of their voices, their participation. That's it's very, very chal challenging. Um, there's a lot of questions, so I'm going to get to as many as I can here. Uh, problems with the sound. Yeah, sorry about that again. Uh, audio is doubled, echo, yeah. <laughs> Okay. Um, shoot. Yeah. How can a sexual act be intrinsically evil if it is between two consenting adults? A good question. I think one, the tradition would say, well, if it's not within a marriage relationship, then it's immoral. But I think we also have to look at where you have consent, but the sexual act is a mere exchange physically. And, and I teach sexual ethics at Creighton, and one of the issues I address is hookup culture. And by hookup culture, it's only physical by the very definition of hookup. It's physical and consensual. And you say, okay, well, that, that's a pretty low bar. Is it meaningful? And I think from a Christian perspective, I think one, it's artificial. The whole idea of a hookup is artificial. I don't, I'm not convinced you can have just a purely physical exchange in terms of human sexuality. I think emotions, uh, psychological responses will be part of that, whether they should be or not. In terms of the definition, I think it's unavoid, uh, unavoidable, positive or negative. So I think consent, and and adults are minimal 
we need to ask more about the meaning of the relationship, but I think those are legitimate questions. I think intrinsic evil has painted a very broad brush uh, uh, across sexuality that limits it very narrowly to only reproductive sexual acts between a married couple. You can have spousal rape. So marriage doesn't guarantee sexual acts. The question is, does an unmarried or non-reproductive or non-heterosexual sexual act guarantee immorality or a violation of human dignity? And I think the answer to that question is obvious. Uh, Do you really think that the more negative narrative that you discuss will ever be eclipsed by a more positive view as long as those texts remain available for citation? I think so. I mean, you have a lot of texts that that condone slavery, for instance, and now and they're still available, but the church has moved beyond that. The same with torture, the same with uh, usury. Etc. So it's kind of interesting when the church changes a teaching, it usually doesn't say we taught this, but we're changing and now we teach this. <laughs> a more accurate uh, pre presentation of that is as the church has always taught and then it changes <laughs> that teaching. So I think there's a possibility and, and the fact that people in leadership positions, unfortunately all men, but people in leadership positions are speaking out that we really do need to evolve and change. And Amoris Letizia has paved the way in terms of an official magisterial document that paves the way for an organic development of, of doctrine. Yeah, synodality only works if the parish engages in the process, mine does not. I think it, the response to synodality really varied across the U.S. In our archdiocese, it was really unfortunate because that whole synodal process, there was a report and a compilation of the report and one thing that came out is uh, a real concern about hospitality for queer people in the church. And to, it, to its credit, the Archdiocese reported that and other things. It didn't report on climate change in the synodal report, which I know I was at several of those synodal meetings and that was discussed, but that wasn't included. Um, but a month after that, Dawson report came out, then the Archdiocese issued a statement on uh, sexual sexuality policy, which is fundamentally alienating the LGBTQ community in our Catholic schools for parents, for faculty, staff, students, etc. So again, there's real tension there uh, between within the church, but also within diocese of the response to synodality. Cardinal Supich, Cardinal McElroy were very proactive, very uh, encouraging of that participation. Other dioceses weren't so encouraging. And there's somewhat of a suspicion among many of the bishops in the US and worldwide, unfortunately, about this whole process. If Francis dies tomorrow, what happens to Catholic sexual ethics? I don't know. I think for myself, a real defining moment is going to be who follows Pope Francis. I think it could all be undone. I am very optimistic. He's made a, appointed a lot of cardinals. But look, the Holy Spirit works in mysterious and miraculous ways. After John Paul's long papacy and Benedict's papacy, we got Pope Francis. And no one would have expected that in a way. So it's hard to say, but I think I'm hopeful. I think uh, we've opened up the process of synodality, and I think it's very hard to retreat from that. I think people are hungry for that. They want to be heard. They want uh, to be in dialogue, and they they want change in a lot of areas, too, especially regarding human sexuality. Um Let me see.
Do you think optional celibacy in the priesthood res would result in the clergy more compassionate towards understanding of the struggles among the faithful concerning questions of sexuality? I do think that. I, I think a couple points here. First of all, we have married clergy. We have married priests. The sad part is, not a sad, but sad from the Catholic side. Sad part is if you're Protestant and you're married and you become Catholic and you want to be a priest, you can be ordained a priest and stay married. Okay, But if you're a Catholic priest, and you fall in love, want to marry, then you're reduced from the clerical state. And that's illogical. Um, we're losing a lot of wonderful men and not including a lot of wonderful women in the priesthood who should be included. And historically, it's very problematic. First of all, Peter was married, right? our first pope, <laughs> according to Catholic tradition. Uh, priests were married commonly for the first thousand years in the church. So this isn't a, a, a dogma. It's a practice in the church, and the practice has exceptions. And so I think that lived experience, I think many priests can relate to married people. They had a mother or father saw uh, them in relationship. They have some knowledge experience, but I think there could be an additional wealth of knowledge and experience in a married clergy and that could draw insight, especially, I mean, you have sexual abuse in other denominations, but I think there are some uh, disparities there. And I think if you had women in leadership positions in the church, the denial and the cover-up, which is a real scandal of the sex abuse crisis. Obviously, the sex abuse was uh, criminal, sinful, and wrong, but the real scandal is a cover-up by leadership in the church. And I think a married priesthood and women, particularly in, in leadership roles, could be very, very helpful. No, I, th I think... Yeah. Um... We're coming. It's 8.45. This was a great presentation. I want to thank you on behalf of everyone who's there. I think the questions could go on for another hour. And I'm hoping that people will continue the conversation um, in the places where they are, whether they're here in New York, other places in the United States, outside the United States. But at least we've had this forum tonight um, to think intelligently about the church's teaching on sex and sexuality. And I think everybody goes home tonight. Very grateful to you as I am for spending this time with us. So thanks Todd. Everybody who is joining us tonight, thank you for coming. I hope to see you on, I think October 4th when Barbara Newman uh, will be taking us through sex and sexuality uh, from Cantal of Canticles all the way through the mystics. So good night everyone. Thanks again, Todd, really appreciate it. Good night. Thank you.